simply cannot accept the treatment of Palestinians, both inside Israel as second-class citizens and in the West Bank and Gaza as an occupied people. I think that that's just a disaster in the making. I think the only way that uh, peaceful and normal relations between the Israelis and Palestinians uh, in that area will ever come about is if the Palestinians get to you know, have an independent state uh, in which they can determine their own fate. I believe that the, that the policies that Israel has espoused uh, virtually since its beginnings, with particular force again since 1967, will ultimately result in a second and possibly terminal holocaust. I'm concerned with the, primarily and centrally, with the position of the United States of America uh, on this, with the radical and total inconstance of the kind of all-out support uh, uh, subsidy, arming, and so on that we give uh, to Israel, uh, given the fact that what they're doing to the Palestinians completely, flagrantly, and all but declaredly in terms, violates the commitments of this nation to the, uh, to the aims and to the criteria of good government. We know from the record, we know from the State Department records, we know from the highly uh, sanitized State Department records um, of the violate, widespread violation of human rights, um, violations of the Geneva Convention, yet we continue to give aid. Settlements in the occupied territory, continued occupation, these are very costly policies. And if the Israelis had to pay, if the Israeli citizens had to pay the true cost of these policies, I suspect that they would have opposed them in greater numbers than they oppose them now. The U.S. has been funding uh, these policies for a long time, and therefore it, it hasn't already been influencing um, the Israeli politics. If the Israelis were forced to choose between uh, paying for the occupation themselves or not paying for it, I think it's obvious that the arguments of those who are against occupying the territory of others on principle uh, would be strengthened. So I regard it really as an act of solidarity with those in Israel who are opposed to the occupation to say that the United States should not finance the extreme right in Israel. And what this is, is a concealed subsidy to militarism, to the settlers, to the fanatics, um, and to the racists. It's important historically for Jews, wherever they are, to associate themselves with the cause of justice, just to begin with. I think that's really a significant part of Jewish identity at its uh, fullest expression. I'm Mark Brzezonski. I'm the founder and chairperson of the Jewish Committee on the Middle East, and it's my privilege to introduce this videotaped documentary of Professor Noam Chomsky's lecture, The New World Order, Latin America, and the Middle East, delivered in Washington, D.C. on November 23, 1991 at George Washington University. Arguably the most important intellectual alive. That's how Noam Chomsky was described a few years ago in a rare New York Times reference. Without much argument, Noam Chomsky is in a class by himself as the foremost American political critic of our time. Perhaps Dr. Chomsky's unique stature is well illustrated by an experience I had several years ago. I recall browsing through the ubiquitous chain of small bookstores along London's Charing Cross Road. In one, the shelves were all organized and labeled by geographical region, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, but there was one striking exception there was a separate section for Chomsky's many volumes. Noam Chomsky brings to his writing and speaking an intensely penetrating mind and encyclopedic knowledge along with a deep commitment to the truth. 
he unravels the semantic deceptions and political hypocrisies with which we are all constantly bombarded through a unique style of incisive analysis and dry humor. Listening to Chomsky is like taking a refreshing intellectual bath which washes away the daily clog of self-serving commentary and mediocre analysis constantly cutting through to the basic core issues. Chomsky puts in clear perspective, better than any other political analyst of our age, the modern-day imperialistic and anti-democratic practices of the industrialized nations, especially our own. Reviled by much of the mainstream political elite, especially the American Jewish establishment because of his opposition to the policies of the Israeli government, adored by many independent intellectuals and activists, Chomsky constantly fills lecture halls and churches all around the country, even while his writings are rarely accepted in any of the mass circulation newspapers and magazines. Among his many associations, Professor Chomsky is on the advisory committee of JCOM, which was among the sponsoring organizations for this lecture, and incidentally the only Jewish organization willing to be a sponsor. More information about JCOM will be presented at the conclusion of the short question and answer period which follows the lecture. Now it is my personal honor to introduce Professor Noam Chomsky, speaking at George Washington University, speaking on the New World Order, Latin America, and the Middle East. We are very fortunate today to have Noam Chomsky of MIT here to offer his unique and penetrating analysis of the true nature of the New World Order. His work has ranged from groundbreaking research in the area of linguistics to a variety of books, including Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Media, Necessary Illusions, Thought Control and Democratic Societies, The Culture of Terrorism, and two volumes on the political economy of human rights, and many others. He has combined his fearless criticism of U.S. foreign policy with a role as a tireless activist, working with organizations such as the Jewish Committee on the Middle East, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, and the War Resisters League. He has written for numerous publications such as Lives of Our Times and Z Magazine. We in the Progressive Student Union hope today's inquiry will inspire you to become involved with any of the important organizations addressing the terrifying reality of American foreign policy. Please help me in welcoming Noam Chomsky. struggle today is going to be the struggle against the heat of those television lights. In fact, uh, I'll start believing in the miracles of Japanese technology when they figure out a way to uh, televise without roasting the person who's standing up in front. Uh, the, uh, the announced topic was the New World Order, Central America and the Middle East, uh, which touches quite a few bases. Uh, and a title like that leaves essentially two options. Uh, one option is to speak in general terms about the New World Order, which as far as I'm aware is the Old World Order uh, adapted to changing contingencies as happens all the time. The most important of these changing contingencies have, have, having been about 20 years ago when the post-war uh, international economic system essentially was torn apart and has been reconstructed. Uh, a second option would be to pick some crucial issues, some particular topics, and to use them to illustrate the way the, uh, the general contours of the New World Order, and that means the Old World Order. Uh, and it, thinking about it, seemed to me that the second tack might be more informative, and in fact almost any current issue could be used uh, because they all illustrate the same essential features uh, of policy, and given U.S. power, uh, U.S. policy has an overriding and often determinative influence, uh, uh, and uh, furthermore, they all illustrate the same aspects of the ideological cover within which policy is presented to us, some examples of which you just heard from our illustrious leader. Uh, the two examples that are listed in the announcement, uh, Central America and the Middle East, are perfectly natural ones. Uh, both regions, Latin America and the Middle East, are covered by what has been the long-standing 
central doctrine of uh, U.S. policy, the Monroe Doctrine, uh, which says, in effect, that certain regions of the world are U.S. turf. Uh, no one else raises their head. Uh, no foreign entries, certainly, but crucially, no indigenous groups. Uh, and if they do, their heads are cut off. Uh, uh, if they get out of control, as the doves like to put it. The Monroe Doctrine was, of course, devised for the Western Hemisphere in a period of in less ambitious days. Uh, its uh, meaning for the Western Hemisphere was recently clarified in the Gates hearings. Uh, one of, maybe the only interesting thing that happened in the Gates hearings, as far as I noticed, was a memorandum uh, that was released uh, in, from December 1984 in which Gates, which is addressed from Gates to William Casey, the head of the CIA, uh, on U.S. policy toward Nicaragua. And it opened by saying that we have to start talking tough about Nicaragua, uh, let's stop the pretenses about uh, preventing arms to El Salvador and all of this other nonsense, which is so easily exposed. Uh, although, I should say, the media continued to trot it out when it was useful. Uh, and. Uh, uh, let's talk, we have to start talking tough, and then he said, we have to rid the hemisphere of this regime by any means necessary, any means that we can use up to bombing. Uh, and, uh, that, and he pointed out correctly that if we don't accept this c commitment to rid the hemisphere of anybody we don't like, we will have abandoned the Monroe Doctrine, which confers upon us that right. Well, it was interesting, actually, the, the day that that appeared, I happened to be talking somewhere in Detroit, and I suggested to the audience that they keep their eyes open to see what the reaction will be to, these, to this memorandum, predicting that there would be a null reaction. And in fact, that's true. It never came up in Congress. The media didn't mention it. It wasn't considered one of the big issues. And that's exactly correct, because essentially everyone agrees across the spectrum, it's agreed that we have a right to rid the hemisphere, or for that matter, the world, uh, of anybody we don't like by any means that we, uh, that we find feasible and uh, possible, and that he is quite right in saying that is the meaning of the Monroe Doctrine. Well, the Monroe Doctrine was extended to various, in this particular sense, meaning we have a right to rid any area of anyone we don't like. Uh, if it was extended to large parts of the world after the Second World War, that's just a reflection of the extraordinary power of the U.S. at the time. And in particular, it was extended to the Middle East, uh, which uh, was described by the State Department right after the Second World War as the most important area in the world uh, in the field of foreign investment, uh, as uh, General Eisenhower described it, the strategically most important area in the world because of its enormous energy reserves, which have two crucial features. First of all, whoever has influence and control over them has a considerable amount of leverage in world affairs. And secondly, there's a huge flow of capital uh, that comes from the profits uh, from oil production in the cheapest and most abundant areas. And that has to flow back uh, to prop up the, both the corporations and the general economy of the United States and uh, the country that in internal discussion is called our lieutenant, uh, namely Britain. Uh, added addition to this is our lieutenant, the fashionable word is partner, as Mike Mansfield put it in the Kennedy years. So we have to prop up the economy of our lieutenant and, uh, of course, ourselves more crucially, uh, and control over the uh, uh, energy resources and the profits that flow from them uh, is a major uh, uh, factor in that. That's in fact, discussed in internal declassified secret top planning documents, uh, but it's also very evident in policy. Uh, and we saw examples of that a few months ago. So in other words, Latin America and the Middle East are the, uh, th these are the obvious areas to discuss if you want to consider uh, the, um, the core of American U.S. foreign policy interests. They, both areas reveal to us quite a lot about ourselves. Uh, the reason is because of our overwhelming influence in Latin America for over a century, in the Middle East for half a century. Uh, and uh, what we find there uh, can uh, tell us a good deal about who we, in fact, are, uh, a topic which should be of interest to any honest person. Well, discussion of Latin America could uh, open, for example, 
with a uh, Latin American strategy development workshop in Washington, the Pentagon, uh, just a year ago, uh, which involved noted academic specialists and others. Uh, they concluded, I'll be mostly quotes, they concluded that uh, current relations with Mexico, the Mexican dictatorship, that means it's a rather brutal dictatorship with a democratic cover, uh, current relations with the Mexican dictatorship, they said, are extraordinarily positive. That means that they are untroubled by such trivialities as stolen elections, death squads, endemic torture, scandalous treatment of workers and peasants, uh, ecological destruction in the interests of private power, uh, and so on. But uh, they said that everything is not rosy. There are some problems on the horizon. And the, main, the only problem they note is, I'll quote, a democracy opening in Mexico could test the special relationship by bringing into office a government more interested in challenging the United States on economic and nationalist grounds. So right now everything's fine because it's just a brutal dic and uh, murderous dictatorship. But if there's a democracy opening, we may have some problems uh, because a democracy opening might mean that uh, various popular interests might be reflected uh, and that would be harmful uh, to uh, the US concern, uh, which is, of course, investment opportunities and uh, the local wealthy classes and so on. Well, that hits the nail on the head. Uh, the primary concern of the United States in the third world has, in fact, always, uh, has been the problem of meaningful democracy, uh, which is, in fact, a threat to power and privilege. And that has to be crushed. It has to be crushed abroad, and it has to be crushed at home. And without understanding that, uh, you understand very little about domestic or foreign affairs uh, and, or about American society and culture. Now, of course, the methods for crushing democratic forces abroad and at home are different. Abroad, you can do it pretty much in the way it's done by totalitarian states. You can use violence, in fact, unrestricted violence. At home, uh, over centuries of popular struggle, the capacity of the state to coerce and control has been limited, so a whole variety of other devices have been needed. But it's been well understood, and it's a major theme of uh, intellectual discourse, if you like, for centuries, that methods have to be found to control and divert what used to be called the rascal multitude uh, and to keep them from interfering in what is none of their business, uh, namely the management of public affairs. As Walter Lippmann put it, uh, the elements that rule have to be protected from meddling and ignorant outsiders, that is, the mass of the population. And if you can't do it by force, you do it by other means. Well, a few weeks after this uh, report on our extraordinary, uh, on the extraordinarily positive relations with uh, the Mexican tyranny, a leading journal in Mexico published an article by a, uh, a reporting on a conference in Mexico, a uh, conference on uh, <coughs> international traffic of children, minors. Uh, the report quotes uh, a leading researcher at the National University, the Autonomous University in Mexico from the Institute for Law Research, uh, who writes that uh, uh, every year 20,000 uh, Mexican children are sent illegally to the United States uh, for the use of, uh, for organ transplants or sexual exploitation uh, or uh, various experimental tests. Uh, the conference report also quotes a report of the United Nations uh, saying that over a million uh, uh, over a million children a year suffer from slavery, um, forced participation in criminal acts, uh, prostitution, uh, organ transplant, uh, sale to rich countries. Uh, well, is any of this true? Uh, the answer to that is nobody really knows, and more importantly, nobody cares, at least nobody important cares. It's not the kind of thing we discuss around here. Uh, but it is uh, the most, uh, whether it's true or not, it may be, it may not be, uh, the interest, an interesting fact about our domains is that this is very widely believed. There's lots and lots of reports uh, like this one from all through Latin America uh, and other parts of the third world domains of the United States, largely of the United States, uh, that report such things. 
Uh, you can get similar reports from the London Anti-Slavery Society and others. Uh, and whether they're true or not, the fact that they're widely believed alone uh, is a reflection of the reality of life uh, in the areas where our influence uh, has been overwhelming. Uh, this became much worse during the Reagan-Bush years, which was a period of an enormous catastrophe of capitalism uh, throughout the entire world, uh, in the, aside from the state capitalist industrial countries themselves, which in various ways were able to protect themselves from it. Uh, Latin America is a striking example. We might proceed with Latin America uh, by quoting, I'll just pick something that happened to arrive in the mail yesterday, um, a uh, Latin American church journal, uh, which uh, has an article from Uruguay by a Uruguayan journalist uh, called The War Waged on Latin American Street Kids, which is a translation of it. Uh, and he describes uh, the war, I'll give some quotes, the war being waged against millions of abandoned children uh, throughout Latin America where death squads run by the police and financed by the business sector uh, target and exterminate street kids who are trying to survive as beggars, thieves, prostitutes, drug runners, or cheap factory workers. Uh, some of the victims are gunned down while they're sleeping uh, beneath, below bridges on vacant lots and in doorways. Others are kidnapped, tortured, and killed in remote areas. Uh, in Brazil, where U.S. Uh, influence has been decisive. The takeover, the overthrow of Brazilian democracy was described as the greatest victory for freedom in the mid-20th century by the administration when it took place with no little U.S. support. Uh, the, in Brazil, the bodies of young death squad victims are found in zones outside the metropolitan areas uh, with their hands tied showing signs of torture, riddled with bullet holes. Street girls are frequently forced to work as prostitutes. Uh, in one town in the first six months of 1991, a thousand so-called disposable children were assassinated in Guatemala City, another place where we have succeeded in imposing the kind of values we like. Uh, the majority of the 5,000 street kids work as prostitutes. Uh, they are found in, with their ears cut off and their eyes gouged out and so on. Uh, in Rio de Janeiro and San Paulo, Reports indicate an average of three children under the age of 18 killed daily by these death squads financed by the business, business communities. Almost all murders have been attributed to those death squads uh, uh, going on. Uh, the journalist points out that this is a region where 183 million people live in abject poverty, so that death by violence is only one of the threats for street children. Uh, regional statistics show that every minute 28 children die from hunger. According to UNICEF, 69 million children survive by doing menial labor, robbing, uh, running drugs, and prostitution. In Ecuador, uh, about 100,000 children from age four up uh, work uh, 10 to 12 hour shifts in one region uh, in Western run, mostly US run corporations. Uh, Panama had some uh, a system for protection of minors, but the minors' protective tribunal buildings were bombed during the 1989 U.S. invasion, rendering work there nearly impossible. Following the invasion, the number of criminal gangs uh, robbing uh, stores in search of food increased. Uh, in Peru, 50,000 of the 600,000 children born this year will not survive their first year. Uh, in one Brazilian state on the Bolivian border, Approximately 1,000 children work as slaves, extracting tin. Uh, another 2,000 adolescents work as prostitutes, according to union sources. Uh, children work 18 hours a day in water up to their knees and are paid a daily ration of bananas and boiled yucca, reported according to uh, labor union reports uh, going on. I won't go on reading it. Uh, he and the journalist ends up saying that until recently, the image of the, image of the abandoned Latin American child uh, was, the, was of a ragged child sleeping in a doorway. Today, the image is of a body lacerated and dumped in a city slum. Well, we may feel proud of our contributions to this picture of capitalist democracy triumphant uh, in the New World Order, and that's what the New World Order is all about. Uh, an intensification of the horrors of the old world order. 
Well, instead of continuing through the Latin American horror chamber, which is what it is, uh, I'll turn to the second area, the Middle East. Uh, and uh, let me just, there's a lot to talk about there, uh, to talk about some of our exploits in the Gulf, for example. But instead, uh, let me talk about the topic that's on the front pages right now. It has been for the several, last several weeks, the, what's called the Middle East Peace Process, and in particular, the conference in Madrid. Uh, this is not now, I'm not going to be giving, continuing with Latin American atrocity stories, but talking about diplomacy, nice, clean topic, so it won't be so bloody. Uh, the, uh, but let's have a look and see what we can learn about ourselves from that. Well, um, I'm sure you all read the newspapers, and you've noticed that there is universal acclaim for the diplomatic triumph of George Bush and James Baker uh, in Madrid. Uh, so let me just remind you of some of the boilerplate. Uh, our heroes, I'll quote now, our heroes exploited the historic window of opportunity opened by their victory in the Gulf to breathe light into on the stalled Middle East peace process, showing remarkable courage and vision. Uh, that happens to come from Anthony Lewis, who is one of the most critical of U.S. government uh, uh, commentators on U.S. government policies anywhere in the mainstream, and it sort of goes from there over to the real accolades. Uh, the uh, <laughs> United States uh, can at last uh, try to bring about its traditional goals of land for peace and territorial compromise and autonomy for the Palestinians in the context of a general peace uh, now that the rejectionists are in disarray and the Russians are no longer causing mischief and the bad guys everywhere know that what we say goes, as the president put it last February. Uh, that's also true in Latin America where what we say goes has been true for a long time with consequences of the kind that I've already indicated. Uh, the news columns turning from, uh, they report with considerable awe that the president is dreaming great dreams of peace and justice uh, and, of course, marching forward to implement them. That's diplomatic correspondent R.W. Apple in the New York Times. Uh, James Baker is praised for his diplomatic skills and his tenacity uh, in putting together what the Times calls the remarkable tableau in Madrid. Uh, I should, to be accurate, point out that not everyone agrees that the U.S. has really shown itself to be an honest broker. Uh, there are people who claim that Bush and Baker have gone too far in allowing their pro-Arab sympathies uh, to influence what they do. Uh, but it's agreed that, we're, that they're both well on their way to a, um, a well-deserved uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Well, that's sort of standard. But more interesting than this kind of rather standard sort of Stalinist-style rhetoric. It's very reminiscent of the days of the genius Stalin and so on, for those of you who 